We are here tonight as uh, Mid-Missouri PeaceWorks and Missouri River Bird Observatory to uh, bring you the last of our Earth Month workshops. This one was uh, postponed a little bit. And so uh, we're lucky enough to have Dana Ripper from Missouri River Bird Observatory back with us uh, to do this workshop called Vote With Your Fork. And I'm very excited about this topic. It's been a, a passion of mine for quite some time. My name's Laura Wacker. It's not really Mark Heim. And uh, well, I'm from Mid-Missouri PeaceWorks. And uh, this is um, something that we present uh, throughout the course of the years we have presented on this topic. And uh, Dana does such great workshops. Uh, we are so lucky to have her doing this one here tonight. So I'll uh, turn it over to Dana Ripper. Thank you very much, Laura. I'm gonna go right ahead and screen share folks. Seemed like it worked when we tested it just a minute ago. Okay. Um, so big topic we have here tonight and I've uh, done some extra you know current research on this topic this week and I hope to keep this to hopefully a little under an hour and then I will be delighted to take any questions at the end tonight. Um, if you are worried that you might forget your question you can always feel free to put it in the chat and Laura will see it. I won't see it while I'm presenting um, but we can uh, discuss it at the end. So just really briefly my background. I know quite a few folks on here, but some of them I don't think I've ever met before. Um, I live in Marshall, Missouri, which is where I'm presenting from this evening. I have a master's degree in wildlife biology many years ago now from Arkansas State University. Um, and that little map down there at the bottom with all the stars on it shows the places that I worked on birds and their ecology and conservation, which is a very typical thing to do in the wildlife ecology field, um, go around and, and do a bunch of different jobs um, in different places. Uh, I settled down in Missouri in 2008, um, and my husband and I co-founded the Missouri River Bird Observatory in 2010. And this is who we are. We are headquartered in Arrow Rock, Missouri. The house that you see on the left is um, a very, you know, outside of town rural location that's becoming our nature school. And then the place that you see on the right is our visitor center that is actually open now on Main Street on Friday, Saturday and Sunday. So you can come visit us if you would like to. Um, in a nutshell, our, uh, our mission is the conservation of birds and their habitats via science, education and advocacy. Um, and down there on the bottom, you can see the current Merbo staff. We're still a pretty small organization, but we really get a lot of stuff done. Um, from left to right is myself, Ethan Duke, co-founder, Paige Wittick, education coordinator, Marley Dodson um, with a pallid sturgeon there, operations assistant. Jordan Lane is our new nature school coordinator and Jen Dummer there on the very right is our new education coordinator. So some of these folks are on here tonight along with, I saw a couple of my board members. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, and I also sort of hijacked Marley into maybe putting some links in the chat for me while I'm presenting since I can't do that. So thanks all for coming tonight. Um, so this is going to be a bird's eye view of the food system, if you will, um, and the connections between birds and other wildlife and their habitats and our food system with a little bit of history and some current events um, and why we're concerned as bird conservationists about this particular topic. But really briefly before I talk about the more you know, wildlife and environmental quality connections, I wanna share an anecdote that happened just yesterday. I had a couple of yearly checkups with my regular doctors um, and they actually suggested getting some screenings for cancer and other diseases that were previously recommended for people at least 50 and in some cases older. I just turned 45, I was very not pleased to hear that I needed to have these screenings and both of them independently said, well, we're finding a lot more cancer these days and it's basically because of the food that we eat and the packaging it comes wow. that, that it comes in and the you know environmental chemicals that we're we're putting out into the world now. Um, so I thought that that was 
a sort of, you know, parallel, but very much intertwined and related issue to how it's affecting our wildlife, our waterways, our air, et cetera. Um, so to get more back into the birds and other wildlife, folks might have seen this, um, this study that came out it was quite heavily carried by the media in late 2019. And so Cornell University and others have determined through the, the vast data sets that have been collected on birds um, in the uh, North American continent since 1970 that we've lost about 3 billion of our birds. There are about 3 billion birds less than there were in 1970. And these declines have not been uniform across groups. If you check out this graphic here, you can see the declines have been most precipitous in our grassland birds. Um, it's not a great scenario for, for a lot of different groups of birds, but for grassland birds, it's the worst. Oh, yeah. And that is very much related to um, our food system that we'll be discussing tonight. All right, so I'm gonna don't <laughs> this slide I know is super, super busy, um, but I think it proves an important point. This is from BirdLife International, and this is globally. This is not just in North America now. So you see in the middle here, Laura, can y'all see my cursor if I move uh -huh. it around? Yeah. Cool. Um, so there's over 1300 globally threatened bird species out of about 9,800 bird species on the planet. And if you look, at each of these um, lines going off, you can basically see the factors that are affecting um, the declines and eventual threatened status of these bird species. So, you know, right here, mm -hmm. residential and commercial development. And you can see by the size of the circles, how much of an impact that is having on bird declines. You know, here's, here's logging, here's invasive species. Um, and this is overall, because a lot of folks on here will know that, um, the biggest direct killer of birds um, is actually outdoor and feral cats. Um, but this is including indirect um, effects such as the things we're gonna talk about tonight, which are habitat loss and, and toxicity and, and climate change as well. So if you look up here, the magnitude of agriculture's effects on our bird species globally is the biggest of these circles. Um, and if you further look within that category, you can see that crops, and livestock farming are, are the biggest within the agriculture component. Um, uh, so how does that- Can I uh, yeah. just ask a question here on that yeah, slide? Yeah, uh, sure. Is yep. there anywhere that it says wind turbines? So that's gonna be over in energy production and mining over here. Okay. And so that's gonna be part of the renewable energy. And thanks, Laura, for going back to this, because um, the numbers in each of these bubbles is the exact number of species um, for which these things are directly contributing to their declines. So, you know, this is big. Um, with wind turbines, the, it's placement, 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 location, location, location. Um, they can be placed in such a way to minimize their impacts on birds. Thank you. Absolutely. So how does, uh, what happens here? How is this happening? What's going on? What's the history and why has that become such a, you know, sort of pervasive and impactful problem? And here are the main kind of categories of effects, if you will. Um, habitat loss, of course, toxicology and, and climate change and agriculture's um, contributions to that and also the effects of climate change upon agriculture. So getting back a little bit, you know, from the global level down to more of the Missouri state level and our region for the moment. So I think most folks will know that um, the tall grass prairie region extended throughout what we think of as the Midwest. And here in the state of Missouri, we had about, historically, we had about 12 million acres of tall grass prairie. And this was the extent across our state based on soil types, glaciation, um, terrain, et cetera. So folks will know that, you know, down here we have the Ozark Mountains and their forests. Um, but a lot of the rest of our landscape here in, you know, Northern and, and Southwest Missouri 
was tall grass prairie. So this is the pre-settlement extent of tall grass prairie in the state of Missouri. And this is the extent of native unplowed tall grass prairie today. So you can see there's a couple little dots up here. Folks might be familiar with Dunn Ranch. Dunn Ranch shows up here on this map and here, there's a few prairies down in, in Southwest Missouri that are you know, large enough in acreage to still be visible on this map, but we've lost um, everything but about 68,000 acres of our native prairie. So regionally speaking right now, um, we're continuing to lose it. These are sort of the, the most recent regional numbers. And between 2011 and 2015, we had very, very high crop commodity prices and we lost to, to you know, being plowed up and converted, we lost another 7 million acres of the tall grass prairie region to conversion to agriculture. Um, so you can imagine that with this much loss, it's definitely going to affect our native biota, including our grassland birds, of course. Um, and this is from the same study and their outreach materials. Um, this is the number we saw earlier, right? Uh, loss of 53% over all of our grassland bird populations. And you can see a common and well-known species like the Eastern Meadowlark is no longer all that common. Um, this is a loggerhead shrike here on the top left. Um, my understanding from folks that have lived in Missouri longer than I have is that they maybe 30-ish years ago, they used to be quite a lot more common. I know many people that have actually watched this decline and observed it. And here in the lower right, we have the greater prairie chicken, um, which we now have probably only about 100 individuals left in the state of Missouri. This is a species that needs a very extensive amount of native grassland um, to, to complete its life cycle su successfully. Um, we have also lost here in the state, again, um, a, a large amount of our wetlands. So these are you know, typically, of course, associated with, with riverine systems um, and, and our important parts of our watersheds. The picture here is of a bottomland forest. This is in the boot heel. Um, another important type of wetland is what we call emergent marsh. And here's a picture of, of what that can look like. Um, very productive, very biologically rich ecosystems. And I took this particular picture actually standing on a levee, and this was in the boot heel. Um, this is a wetland reserve easement privately owned and restored by the NRCS with the, with the private landowner. And that was on one side of the, the levee. And this is what was on the other side of the levee. And so when you have you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of acres or even millions of acres that you know, once were prairie or wetlands, and they are now this, you can imagine that the loss of biodiversity, of course, goes all the way up the chain until we have very little left. So we've lost, you know, about 99% about of our native prairie, and we've lost about 87% of our, of our native wetlands. So a couple, just to give you all an example, a couple of birds that that affected are the Backman's warbler, which was a very poorly known, poorly studied species that lived in bottomland forest. And the last ones were seen in the early 1980s. This is one that um, most, you know, most bird watchers don't even really know this bird. It was it was very obscure and its its loss wasn't well known the way that the passenger pigeon was or the Carolina parakeet was. Those are kind of more famous stories of extinction, but this little guy kind of went out with a whimper. Um, in the lower right here is a king rail. This is an emergent marsh species. You can see this bird standing um, in, a, in a shallow marsh with some emerging vegetation. Um, they eat a lot of crawdads and things like that. And we probably have maybe 10 to 20 pairs of king rails left in the state of Missouri at this point. So getting down even a little bit further in scale, I had to use my home county here as an example. Um, so this is a slide that Ethan uh, made for me. He's uh, a GIS expert. And so he essentially has overlaid, I'm probably gonna get the technicality wrong here, 
here, but he has overlaid historic land cover types um, onto maps, current maps that show political boundaries like counties and states, et cetera. And so these were painstakingly determined um, from old documents and old survey information. Um, and you can see there the citation pre-settlement prairie of Missouri that came out of the MDC in 1982. So it must've been, I think, an enormous amount of work to really, to really map um, using old, old documents um, what the land cover types actually were pre-settlement. So you can see here, Saline County, and I'm sitting about like right there right now. Um, a lot of this was prairie, that, that sort of green squiggly stuff. Um, and then barrens and scrub, so scrub lands. Barrens is kind of an interesting term, but that's what they called it. And then you can see bits of forest, especially around the Missouri River, um, water. And then there was certainly, you know, some, some marshland as well. You can imagine along the meandering Missouri River during pre-settlement times. So that's some historic land cover. And this is from USDA data 2021 cropscape is what it's called. And this is what Saline County looks like now. Here's, here's Marshall and the green is soybeans and the dark green and the uh, yellow is corn. So just here in Saline County, we went from, you know, a rolling prairie savanna, um, more woodlands and wetlands in the, in the river bottoms to a very corn and soy dominated landscape. Um, and so in my 12 years here in the county, I've even seen some of this land conversion for myself. Um, and so it's a little bit ironic when folks ask us as the bird people, you know, hey, what happened to all the quail? Um, or what happened, we used to have whippoorwills when I was growing up. Well, I mean, we've just so drastically changed the landscape that there's just not much room left um, wildlife. Um, so again, this is from um, USDA cropscape data. And this is, again, this is Saline County, just using it as an example. And you can see that just in the last 10 years, folks, we've had a loss of, of grass from, from 2011 to 2021 and an increase in corn and soybeans. I mean, we really don't have that much grass and pasture left. And, it's, and that's not to say that it was like unplowed native prairie to begin with, but even just sort of old fields, some, some pasture, anything that wasn't in crop, we're losing what little we have left um, for row cropping. So big landscape changes over time, right? We went from something that's a super diverse native prairie to maybe fescue um, for cattle forage, which is a grass, but it is a monoculture. As you can see, there's, there's one type of grass here. Um, and we went from you know, the, the native natural historic landscape to originally more of a small farm situation, right? Where we had many, many farms, I'm speaking up until approximately the 70s now. Um, we had farms that grew a variety of crops in most cases had a few different types of livestock as well. And so this was kind of the norm. So this was a big change, right? From this native landscape to these things, but it was an even bigger change from this, you know, crop diverse farm land with, you know, small family farms dotting the landscape throughout the Midwest to this even more of a monoculture um, very few crops, corn and soy dominant, wheat is in there as well, but that is the vast majority of, of crops grown in our area. Um, and also, as we'll see, a um, situation where you had what we now call free range livestock, right, which was the norm <laughs> until a certain point in our history. And now we have these confined animal situations. So big changes across the landscape. And a lot of these were due to, you know, things we often have these human innovations that, you know, 50 or 100 years later, we're like, oh, maybe that wasn't such a great plan after all. Um, so <laughs> a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, the original, uh, the thing that gave us the ability originally to plow up our native tall grass prairie, for instance, which had very, very deep roots, 
um, was the plow. And you can see I have a John Deere plow pictured here. John Deere, of course, is the storied inventor of the plow. Um, but in digging into a little bit of history, I found out that there were actually a lot of different plow makers at the time that were working on very similar technology. Um, and one of the innovations that John Deere actually um, implemented was making them out of steel, which made them harder and able to um, plow up native prairie easier um, and sort of implemented a somewhat Henry Ford-like means of, I don't want to say mass production, but more efficient production of more plows um, in any given year. And so they were <laughs> distributed and he eventually um, sort of became the guy that everybody thinks of as the inventor of our modern plow. Um, so throughout all of these changes and throughout say, you know, that was the 1830s, um, things really started changing in the 1930s with the um, invention of, of hybrid, hybrid crops, hybrid seeds. Um, so a couple different differences that came from that were seeds were hybrids. So farmers had to buy them every year. They did not produce their own savable seeds. That was a really big difference from a system where um, a farmer would grow their crop, but also save seeds um, and not just have to keep buying seeds over and over and over. Of course, we had um, the Dust Bowl years and eventually the New Deal that implemented sort of the forerunners of some of the programs that we still have today where there were price supports um, and there were programs to sometimes keep crops off the market in order to keep um, the prices from falling. There was also the advent of um, the Soil and Water Conservation Service because we had so much erosion, et cetera. Um, another huge change came after World War II, like so many things. Um, Munitions plants had the uh, ingredients such as nitrogen and ammonia that would make for really good fertilizer. It wasn't needed for the war effort anymore. Um, so a lot of plants switched to making synthetic fertilizers and a lot of folks adopted those. And so we saw a huge increase in fertilizer use. So at this point, we have hybrid crops that will produce more and we also have fertilizers that will produce more. Ecologically speaking, um, one of the things that this meant aside from you know, an enormous increase in the amount of fertilizer put on the land was that we had enormous yields in comparison um, to previous years. So with skyrocketing yields during the 50s and 60s era, um, we started getting into where, we, where supply exceeded demand. And so what were we going to do with all of those additional uh, hybrid corn and soybeans? The next sort of major breakthrough that occurred was the advent of genetically modified organisms, right? GM crops. And so there's two kinds. Um, if folks, folks on this call might know this, but we have two main kinds of GMOs. Um, one is herbicide resistant. And those are typically called Roundup Ready, right? So glyphosate, also known by the trade name Roundup, um, is applied to those crops that kill weeds, but not the crops because they are Roundup resistant, they're glyphosate resistant. And the other um, type of GMO are crops that produce their own uh, pesticides, typically insecticides. So it's actually the, the plant itself um, produces, produces insecticides. So kind of gross, isn't it? the first GMO, which was actually a tomato of all things, um, went to market in 1994. And by 2012, more than 90 <clears throat> percent, excuse me, of corn and soy planted in the U.S. Are, were GMO plants. So, I mean, that took off really fast and, and changed everything and, and also created a very, of course, chemically dependent um, situation across the agriculture sector. Um, one thing that I thought was really interesting is that there are actually really only 10 crops that are uh, authorized for use as GMOs in this country. And corn, soy, and cotton are by far the most frequently planted of those. 
So um, I wanted to show this really quick series of slides from our friends at Illinois Natural History Survey. It starts, um, you're gonna, I'm gonna click it, you're gonna see this same picture again. So just kind of try and remember, you know, a couple of the colors. We have wheat, corn, and soybeans. Really pay attention, if you would, to the red and the pink there. All right, so this is 1954. This is Ford County, Illinois. I'd prefer to use the Missouri example, of course, but I just thought these slides were very, very illustrative. So if you would watch the uh, date and the, and the uh, red and pink there. So 1954, 1963, 1965, 1981. So it, over a really short period of time, um, we had really big changes in the diversity of crops typically grown by, by farmers in our region. So who eats all that? And I hope folks on here, and I would think that you probably already know a lot more than I did when I first asked this question as a teenager in Illinois where I grew up. I was like, who eats all this sweet corn? That's, I mean, that's so much. I really like sweet corn, but geez, this is thousands of acres of it. Well, it's not, of course. Um, this is essentially feedstock for other, other things, whether it's processed foods, or whether it goes to livestock feed. Um, we've seen, of course, a, a boom in ethanol additives uh, to, our, to our gasoline. Um, and I found it kind of interesting that just a very small amount of actual soy is used for us to directly consume as soy. So tofu and edamame and soy milk and things like that. So you can see, you know, especially with it going to livestock or going to processed foods, we have a system where we're growing stuff that we don't directly eat ourselves, right? It, it has to go through a, a process. Um, and that's not really a nutritionally or ecologically efficient system. So we've talked a little bit about the, you know, increase in industrialization and mechanization. Of course, when it comes to any ecological topic, human population growth over all this time um, is always a factor. And so some of these things, you know, GMO crops um, are considered positive corporate innovations by, by many folks. Um, they were certainly marketed well, um, but we do have an increasing situation of corporate monopolization um, and regulatory capture, by which I mean, these folks have the money to pay our elected officials to essentially make laws or not make laws in their favor. Um, and so in many cases as well, government policy, even starting as long ago as the New Deal, when um, a lot of the policies, I mean, it was obviously it was a very different time with the depression, with the Dust Bowl, et cetera. The, the policies were fine at the time, um, but over the years, government policy has really come to often drive this system of monopolization and of um, crop monocultures in a very chemically dependent system. So another aspect, and this is, related to the ecology, but not, you know, directly, it's more of a sociological note. Um, so our, as, as agriculture has become a lot more industrialized and a lot more um, reliant upon inputs and equipment, obviously you're gonna see um, less people working on farms and ultimately less farms. And the farms that do exist typically um, on average, are a larger size than they were in the past. Um, and I'm going to ask Marley if you would um, throw in a couple of things. The first one um, is a Smithsonian Magazine article that I thought was really, really interesting and, and really quite unbiased about the history of, um, you know, the use of the plow and the eventual rise of chemical farming. Um, and then a, an interesting report on the consolidation of farms that is causing this trend that you're seeing on this graph here of less farms and of a smaller size. So thanks for doing that. Okay, so to what effect? Um, <laughs> lots, lots of effects. One of them is that, you know, no one can deny that we have a, an abundance of cheap food. Um, I realize that 
you know, currently there's inflation, there's supply chain issues, et cetera. But for a very long time, we had food that in some cases was artificially cheap um, due to subsidies uh, in insurance and, and crop prices assurances. Um, but we feed a lot of people um, with this relatively inexpensive food. So another effect that has happened though, of course, is a major increase in, in chemical use over time. Um, so you can see that on the graph on the right. And you can see on the left here, um, the agricultural use of glyphosate, again, Roundup, right? The herbicide that we have GMOs that are resistant to. So this is the concentration um, pounds per square mile is the coloration of the map. Um, this is it in 1992, and here it is in 2019. So really big riot, rise in the use of glyphosate, right? And folks, I mean, to I don't want to like overly complicate everything, but I'll say simplistically that glyphosate can be considered better than some of the chemicals that it replaced. So we're trying to feed billions of people, there's going to be an ecological trade-off somewhere. So a problem with glyphosate, the most common herbicide, um, is that it's probably carcinogenic. Um, it is considered an endocrine system disruptor in humans, and it is obviously being what it is, detrimental to plant diversity. So one example of how this is detrimental to um, to our ecology is that it's wiped out a lot of milkweed, which is the host plant for the monarch butterfly. Um, so you can see we have a lot of fluctuation in our eastern monarch butterfly populations. Um, this is how they're counted. They're counted at their overwintering sites in Mexico. Um, I, I, would, I bet a lot of folks know about this. Um, it's the most accurate count that we can get of this species. Um, so you can see you know, lots and lots of fluctuation, but since the mid nineties, there's been overall a downward trend um, and we've lost a lot of milkweed. And it's largely due to the rise of, of Roundup and, and Roundup ready crops and the use of glyphosate. So I wanted to show this briefly, um, the maps that I am showing you and the graphs uh, a couple slides ago, these come from the USGS agricultural pesticide use database. Anyone can access this. Um, and I just found it just kind of wild when I, when I went and searched for some of these maps and um, a variety of different agricultural chemicals. Um, this is how many there are. So, it's a very interesting thing to peruse for yourself. Um, see, I just, I made this little video, but you can go up and click on any of them and you can come to these maps and you can go all the way back to 1992 with the concentration. Um, and they'll have a little bit of information about each one. You can see this is imidacloprid. I'm gonna show you something about that here in a second. But beginning in 2015, the provider of the, pesticide data, and this is based on essentially self-reporting in most cases, also sales, um, things like our county extensions will report this sort of information. Um, the data used to derive the county level estimates discontinued making estimates for seed treatment applications because of complexity and uncertainty. So there are a lot of imidacloprid producing or treated seeds so that the plant will produce um, this particular uh, insecticide. So it is a neonicotinoid, which are the most common insecticides in use. Some folks might remember this Time Magazine article from a few years ago. And so the University of Iowa, for example, is starting to show direct effects of this on bird populations overall. You can imagine if we kill a bunch of insects that it's gonna have an effect on bird populations, right? Um, so here's just an example of the, the rise of imidacloprid usage from 2000 to 2014. So unfortunately, um, there's a paper that came out in Nature, you can see the citation down there at the bottom, that, you know, proponents of neo neonics, P. 
people often call them, um, will say that while they're really, you know, starting to drive down the use of other pesticides that are more broadly applied. So you have a plant, right, that makes its own makes its own pesticide, you're not spraying that all over the place. I mean, that's a net positive, I suppose. Um, but it really hasn't lessened the use of non-neonic pesticides all that much. Um, one of the things that is scary as well is that, you know, one of the target species of these insecticides is the corn borer, of course, as a, as a corn pest, um, but it broadly ends up targeting the corn borer's family of insects, which is Lepidoptera, which is our butterflies. Um, so it doesn't differentiate between the corn borer and other butterflies. So what does this mean, mean to birds? I'm an ornithologist, so I've got to always ask this question. Um, you know, of all of our bird species, of which like more than 400 have been recorded in Missouri, um, 96% of them, including birds that eat seeds the rest of the year. So think of like Northern Cardinal, right? Mostly a seed eater. They've got that big seed crunching beak. Um, during the breeding season, they too will feed nice high protein insects to their young. So um, this, is, this is messing with the food chain quite a bit. So I know we were all seeing things like this. This is a Guardian um, article from a few months ago. Um, and so people are really starting to pay attention and really worry because insects do form sort of the basis of our food pyramid, if you will. Um, I mentioned the study a little bit earlier. So one of the things that is difficult in ecology, of course, is there are many, many, many factors affecting everything all the time, right? And so sometimes it's really difficult to prove cause and effect. Um, you know, it makes common sense that if you remove, you know, three quarters of the population of insects and birds eat them, that birds will then decline also. Um, but when it comes to actually advocating for changes in policy um, on behalf of birds and insects, you always have to prove that that's happening. Um, <clears throat> and so there are some scientific papers that are coming out now that are really showing a, an undeniable connection between a lot of our agricultural practices um, and our wildlife. So everyone I think probably knows barn swallows, really, really cute bird. They're here in Missouri right now. Um, this is you know, the type of species that's going to be really affected. They're, they're a um, insectivore, meaning they don't, they don't eat other things. They don't ever eat seeds or anything like that. Um, and so if we remove all our insects, it's gonna hurt birds like this. And finally, climate. Um, so I'm just going to talk uh, just briefly about the agriculture, the industrial agriculture sector's um, contributions to our, our climate change that we're experiencing. This is just a basic um, NOAA temperature analogy and anomaly, excuse me, graph that I'm sure folks have seen. If you haven't, there's a lot of um, really good information and really good graphics on the NOAA website that are, that are quite easy to find. Um, so the National Audubon Society has done an enormous amount of study and modeling of what might happen in various climate scenarios. And 314 species, at least, um, predicted by Audubon to, to really have serious problems if we keep going the way that we're going. So here is, this is recent EPA data, um, agriculture's contribution to greenhouse gas emiss emissions by US economic sector. Um, so you can see agriculture is pretty big. It's not you know, the biggest. We have, of course, industry, manufacturing, et cetera, electricity generation, of course, transportation, of course. And this is, this is all greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so it's interesting to consider um, as, our, as we look at our food system, what this does and does take into account. So these estimates by the EPA and, um, wow, I remembered my link. Marley, if you would be so kind as to put in the uh, full info on greenhouse gas emissions link, it's the direct link to um, where all this comes from. It's very interesting because it expands upon how each sector is 
um, contributing emissions. So in this case, it accounts for um, nitrous oxide emissions, which is a potent greenhouse gas, um, and about half of agriculture's contribution is due to that, and that is due to how soil is managed, um, particularly extensive application of fertilizers. Um, it does include livestock emissions. Um, and unfortunately, yes, I kind of do mean cow farts that everybody makes fun of. Um, but basically, well, I'll put up a, a thing in a second um, about that. And then livestock waste management, which has become uh, a more pervasive uh, source of, of waste pollution and also greenhouse gas emissions. I do want to note that this 11% of you know, contribution to GHGs by economic sector does not account for um, the net reduction in carbon capture that comes when you only have plants growing on a plot of land for a few months a year and it is bare soil the rest of the time, which is a very good argument for cover crops. Um, but importantly, the manufacture and transport of inputs such as fertilizer or seed or whatever um, is not taken into account. And neither importantly is the transportation's outputs. So when we move our crops around to wherever they're going, because they don't just stay there on the farm, that is actually included in the transportation part of this graph and the industry part of this graph. Um, so I would argue that this is a little, a little bit of a, of a uh, underestimate. Um, so one of the things that has, you know, become very clear is that the, <laughs> largely the inefficiency of the system of growing crops to feed enormous amounts of livestock as the world's meat consumption has increased per capita over time. So it is, it is such a big deal that you can see the UN Department of the Environment thinks it's, I mean, 2018, I don't know if it's, if the UN still considers this the world's most urgent problem, but it is a very, it is a very urgent one. Um, and so this is what I wanted to refer you to on that EPA website. Um, so methane, which is a much more um, potent greenhouse gas as far as heat capturing than CO2, we always hear about CO2, right? Um, you know, livestock, especially ruminants, produce a lot of methane, about a quarter of the emissions from the agriculture se sector. Um, and then if you'll turn your attention to this as well, manure livestock, or excuse me, livestock manure management also contributes methane and nitrous oxide emissions. Um, and we'll get to that a little bit more in just one second. So um, the Food and Agriculture Organization um, of the UN have a couple of really interesting reports. Um, I, I didn't, I don't have these links, but I, it, they're very easy to find. I do encourage folks to read them. Um, it's from a global perspective. It's something that we definitely need to get a handle on. And it's something that is potentially um, effectable and workable, something that we can really do something about as far as as far as working on climate change solutions. So I know that folks have probably heard about um, the former Amazon rainforest being turned into the cattle pasture. And um, this is an issue that I think gained even more prominence over the last couple of years um, Marley, the, this, this link's out of order on my document, but if you would put that article in there, um, there was a really pretty in-depth Washington Post article just a couple months ago in 2022 about how and why this is happening um, and how it's not just a South American problem. These products are coming here to the United States, and I'll talk in a second about how they can often be misleadingly labeled so that things that we think are pretty decent for the environment might actually be, be beef from the former Amazon rainforest. So there's kind of a interesting but illus an illustrative series of graphs here. Um, so you can see the Brazilian Amazon is in green. 
These are areas that are now deforested as of 2022. And these are the areas that have been turned into pastures. And folks, this isn't um, small families in need of some you know, farmland for sustenance farming. These are very, very large ranches selling to an industrial system of meat packers. Okay, so let's see. Um, all right, so this is once again, going back to, we're, we're back in the US again. So you can see that over, since 1990, we have some greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and I'm sorry, I, one of the things I wanted to mention, of course, is that the lack of carbon sequestration um, is in the Amazon rainforest due to slash and burn grazing practices is one of the um, most urgent and important um, issues that need to be addressed, right? I think folks have heard it called the world's lungs um, and we cannot keep, um, we cannot, <laughs> we cannot keep burning down the Amazon rainforest for animal agriculture. Um, okay, sorry, back in the United States here, you can see that there's just, you know, really a little bit of um, increase in GHG emissions from our agriculture sector um, since 1990. But one thing that I found really interesting um, is that while GHG emissions, if you can see here, have increased by 6%, this increase is largely driven by a 62% growth in methane and nitrous oxide emissions from livestock manure management systems. Okay, so um, reflecting the increased use of emission intensive liquid systems over this time period. And this is what that is talking about. Um, this is right here, a concentrated animal feeding operation. Um, and these are the lagoons that take the waste from those animals that are kept in concentrated systems. So the reason I wanted to bring this up is because this is a, and again, this might be something that folks are very familiar with because this is right close to home. Um, this has been a, a very front and center issue here in the state of Missouri for several years now. Um, the state of Iowa has, I think, over 10,000 um, Ethan and Marley and other folks around here. If you know the exact number, please speak up. But um, the state of Iowa did not have much of a regulatory framework in place when, when large corporations that promote and own and contract out for these CAFOs came into the state of Iowa. Um, <clears throat> Missouri appeared, appears and appeared to be next on their list of places to expand to. Um, so just to tell you sort of the de definitions, um, animal feeding operations are, um, a little bit smaller than concentrated animal feeding operations. Um, so here's the sort of livestock head definitions of these things come from the EPA um, down to states. So a concentrated AFO is one that has more than a thousand beef cattle, more than 700 dairy cows, 2,500 or more swine weighing more than 55 pounds, 125,000 broiler chickens, um, and 82,000 and or 82,000 laying heads confined um, indoors on a site for more than 45 days. So that's the, the technical definition of a CAFO. And so, and here we see their manure lagoons um, of which, you know, the, this waste is what the EPA was talking about when they talked about the increase in, in manure management emissions. So, this is something that policy-wise has really come to a head here. Um, so this is in 2018, we had a number of counties in the state of Missouri that um, their commissioners or their, their voters by voter referendum wanted to have some regulations that were tougher than the Missouri Department of Natural Resources, which is the agency that um, permits and regulates CAFOs and APOs. Um, and so when I say tougher then, what that means is that they wanted the effluent from these operations to be sprayed more than 50 feet away from a residence or church or school or whatever when the state standards are 50 feet um, or a water source. And so 
these counties chose to have somewhat stricter regulations or zoning um, either on the facilities themselves or on the effluent and waste management. So that was 2018. Um, so this, you know, this is a climate issue based on, you know, what I just said previously about their emissions, but it's also a water, air, and aesthetic issue. Um, folks that, that we know that live near these CAFOs have enormous fly problems, enormous smell problems, E. coli in the streams on their property. So there's all, nobody wants to live next to, you know, a barn with 8,000 hogs in it and the associated affluent and, and other issues. And so, um, but it was also, you know, sort of a choice of the folks in these counties to say, we, we don't want to be that near that thing. Um, and so there were forces that didn't like that, um, to say it simply. Uh, so Missouri Farmers Care, which is a consortium of different um, industry groups and, and probably individuals as well, um, so they kind of waged a campaign throughout Missouri um, for several years. And essentially they had all of the counties shown here in green. Their commission said, we agree, we will, you know, we will sign a statement saying that we will never impose any regulations, restrictions, zoning, et cetera, in this county um, that are any stricter than the Missouri Department of Natural Resources rules that were very industry friendly to begin with. Um, so basically the commissions in these counties, you know, said, we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and, and side with industry. Um, and of course the, the argument was like, you're agro ready, you're gonna bring in businesses and jobs and um, don't, don't worry about the environmental consequences. And so some folks will remember that. So then in 2019, um, Senate Bill 391 came, came to our legislature and eventually passed after an enormous amount of contention and an all night filibuster. Um, and basically it says that no county can impose standards or requirements on an agricultural operation um, and that are more stringent than the state. So the, those counties that I showed you in the first slide that already had uh, zoning or you know other other requirements, it in in a couple cases it's still in court. Um, but essentially, the the Jefferson City Legislature overruled those counties and their voters to say that no, you cannot um, make any rules about where facilities are located or where effluent is sprayed or anything like that. So um, in relation to these facilities, one of the things that we're hearing more and more about is uh, biogas. And um, that is a process by which essentially um, waste is trapped from the lagoons. The emissions are trapped and converted and moved in order to um, use them for energy. So this is a really, really interesting situation because technically it is a renewable energy source, right? You're always going to have thousands of hogs that are creating affluent that you can trap um, and it isn't being, being vented into the air, right? The, the methane and the nitrous oxide from the lagoons is being trapped instead of going into the air. Um, a couple of completely, you know, environmental angles on whether or not this is a good thing um, are that you're still talking about a combustible energy source in the end. Um, yes, it is renewable as long as you keep putting, you know, as long as you keep trapping affluent, typically swine affluent. Um, and also it's a situation where it doesn't work on a very small scale typically. And so it is um, really encouraging the continual concentration and um, increase in size of facilities like this. Um, and you're often left with solid waste after the gas is trapped and used. Um, but this is a, definitely an emerging issue. Um, there are industry-led efforts to 
um, have legislation passed through Jefferson City that essentially mandate our utility providers to work with biogas and create infrastructure for biogas, which is kind of interesting. Um, and I think, Marley, those, I have a couple articles about that. I have a bunch of papers here, but um, I do, yes. Um, so there's an in-depth article um, from Food and Power about what these are, how they work, et cetera. And then um, a statement by the Sierra Club that I found quite interesting because it lays out, you know, the, the positive sides of this as a renewable energy source, but why they as an environmental organization um, ultimately opposed it. Okay, so um, we're at we're at an hour and we're down to the good news. No more bad news. Um, so I find many, many things heartening because I think a lot of this was once like very, very obscure. Um, and we have a lot of information now. We have a lot of research now. We have a lot of organizations that are working to improve the food system for both people and the environment, um, which are you know, obviously one thing. But, um, and so I think it is like a lot of other issues where individual changes are possible <clears throat> and they're also very effective, especially obviously the more and more people do them, but it is also important to continue to work to change the actual system. Um, so what we have here, I think this is a really nice quote. And then we have a farmer's market booth. Um, this is from Sedalia. This is actually a farm um, of one of our employees who shall remain nameless. Um, but I think, so there's a number of different things that one can do, of course. Um, what we have here are cattle grazing on native prairie. Um, so this is a really tough one because I don't think that even if all cattle were now grazed on native prairie, um, that we could still sustain the amount of beef that we globally eat. It probably needs to be a little bit less than what it is. Um, I'm not here to tell everybody tonight how to eat. Um, just speaking of, of the data and what we are able to sustain um, overall. But we do, if we are not going to eliminate beef eating altogether, which I don't know about you all, but I'm not seeing that happen in my lifetime, um, then there are ways, there are grazing systems um, that can be a lot more environmentally friendly and a lot better, a lot better for wildlife than a lot of our fescue based and, and feedlot based systems. So one thing I would encourage is, and I think this is getting, more and more and more known. Um, check out your labeling. Always check out your labeling. A couple of things about that. Um, grass fed. Anybody can say cattle or beef, beef or grass fed. Um, and this is specifically about beef. Pretty much every steer that goes to market eats grass during the beginning of its life, but then it goes to feedlot. So if it says grass fed, you might want to question that. What you want to see is grass finished. It didn't ever go to feedlot. Is it a product of the USA? Folks might have heard of the country of origin labeling um, disputes that have been happening. So right now, um, even cuts can be shipped into the USA. And if they're further processed in, in, the states um, and then package, even if they came from somewhere else, they can still say product of USA right now. Um, hopefully this is changing. USDA is looking into it. There's an act in the US Congress right now about country of origin labeling. Um, and so um, just kind of be aware of that. Um, I and I think, yeah, please. I would just say also that I'm not sold on American made beef when they're eating grass that has been sprayed with glyphosate all over the place, you know? And so um, it, it doesn't mean so much to me to have that labeling. Obviously, if it's coming from 
countries that are nefarious in their ways of production, uh, you know, you would consider that. And I think we're nefarious as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. My note down here of beware of greenwashing is like, I just essentially wanted to remember to say like, if, if it is not explicit on the label slash, you know, your farmer and you know what their farm looks like. I mean, that's really the easiest and best way to do it. And that's the last bit here. Um, but if it, you know, even if it says, these eggs are from free range chickens or, you know, free range cattle or whatever. I mean, Laura, I think you're exactly right. Like, I mean, unless it explicitly states on the label, everything that you want it to say, it is probably misleading you. Um, and really the only way to know that is to, to know your farmer and get it locally and, and know truly where it comes from. And ideally like visit that farm as well. And, and make sure that um, their production practices are are along with your your values. Um, so yeah, the pictures on the right hand side here are actually from the websites of a couple farms that I patronize myself, um, and I've been to both of them. Um, you know, this this is not native prairie right here, um, but there's a lot of diversity on their property and um you know <laughs> most people can't own <laughs> something that looks like this native prairie in missouri anymore um and so i think you know this is like the biggest thing is to find good food sources in your everyday life and really really do research um because it is Food production and food marketing are, are very veiled systems in a lot of ways. Um, and it's by design and they do, you know, have legislation behind them. So I think this is a book that I read, you know, some 10 years ago and, and some folks here might have read it. It's an excellent, excellent book, Michael Pollan. Um, but this is sort of the on mover's dilemma, right? We all, we all do need to eat, um, but how do we do that in a way that is best for for the environment and for wildlife. So this is another option for folks, hunt or fish or, or grow your own, of course. Um, and considering where you might be able to cut back, like maybe not beef, you know, four times a week, maybe two, that would make a really, really big difference if everyone ate a little less. Eating seasonally. Um, I was not surprised to recently learn that we import, of course, more than half of our fruits um, and about a third of our vegetables. So we are definitely like a net importer of those things. And it's because we really have gotten used to, you know, either eating tropical fruits that don't grow here at all um, or eating things that are very, very much out of season. And so, you know, from a, locavore standpoint um trying to eat in season is an interesting ecological exercise um and i just i highly recommend doing it if for research if for nothing else um it also of course cuts back on things like packaging and transport as well to eat locally and in season and then i've got a couple of um aside from from the links. I mean, there's so much on this topic out there. It's so incredibly huge and complex. Um, these are some partner organizations of us that I think do excellent work. They keep people really, really informed. Um, the Missouri Rural Crisis Center um, fights against basically corporate consolidation of the food system um, and works for transparency and independence in our food system. And then Missouri Coalition for the Environment kind of does the same, but comes at it from more of an environmental angle, whereas Crisis Center comes at it from more of a supporting family, um, independent family farms on, in Missouri angle. And then Family Farm Action is a national group. Um, I recommend their website. One of the things that I put 
or that you know Marley put in the chat for me um, was a report from them. They have a lot of really good reports and they are continually working at the federal and regional levels on good food policies. So those are just some recommendations of folks that will keep you up to date on this issue and that are actively working on it all the time. So to end, um, same, same study, that 3 billion bird study that I've been using bird graphics of the entire time. Um, these are guilds of birds that have increased since 1970. It is possible. These are, all of these groups of birds are examples of people saying, wow, they're in decline. We need to do something about that. Let's put some conservation programs on the ground. And so conservation works when we have sort of an alignment of, of you know, people power and demanding action and um, people acting for conservation and then some combination of, of, of programs and regulations that, that help bring back our wildlife and help preserve their habitats and restore their habitats, it does work. Um, and these, these guilds of birds are, are a data rich example of that happening. So thanks for, thanks PeaceWorks for, <laughs> for having me again and everyone who attended. All right, I just so appreciate the work that you do to put these together, Dana, and the valuable, uh, information that you share and give us links for to continue learning about this and um you know if you if you all who have attended uh know other folks that would like to watch this we will be uh linking this this video um we'll upload it and you'll be able to watch it again or share it with some friends uh, and i'm sure uh, Dana will have it on their sites and we'll have it on uh, PeaceWorks and Earth Day and Center for Sustainable Living sites. And, um, you know, Dana's always available uh, with answers to your questions. I'm sure if you contact her, you want to tell them how to do that, Dana? For sure. Um, I'm going to put my email in the chat right now. It's just dana.ripper at merbo.org. Um, there are a couple of things I've just scrolled up a little bit into the chat, Laura, um, if I could address really briefly, is that, sure, do we sure. have like, yeah, a, like I was going to, couple uh, minutes. Um, I wanted to break in and then I oh. started talking and I was muted and then I thought, well, I think you're going to cover it. So, <laughs> um, I I'm like going backwards. Um, Mary says, I believe national Audubon society is sources of grass fed beef. Okay. That's. Yeah, that's really true. I wanted to get into that, Mary, but that's like even more of a tangent. But yes, okay. So um, my organization has actually done the bird surveys on those ranches for National Audubon in Missouri. It is a, a multi-state program all the way out to California, even including the interior West. And we've just done Missouri. So um, we're very familiar with that and a lot of the ranchers and they're awesome. And it's a great pro program. Um, essentially, I'm just, I'm just going to speak to how it works in Missouri. National Audubon works with the Missouri Department of Conservation private lands biologists um, to um, make management plans for the ranches and then the ranches implement them. And um, then, of course, the goal is to have their bird populations specifically um, go up and be, be measurably increased. Um, so you can buy direct from the ranches. Um, the challenge with that is simply that, to my knowledge, at this moment, there's not a retail location in the state of Missouri where you can get that. There used to be, and if someone knows otherwise, please correct me, but I know that REP, R-E-P provisions um, online, interestingly enough, will ship you Missouri Audubon certified beef. I thought there was a source in Columbia, Missouri that you could order from. That was, now this was pre-pandemic, so I don't know. Yes, yes. Um, that was, so that was the root seller, Prairie Bird Pastures. Right. Um, yes, and we used to get it from them. And that's, my understanding is they're not doing that right now, at least. Um, okay, thanks. 
So, oh, um, Ethan's showing me Audubon. Let's put, can you put that in the chat? I put the original link to it. Okay, awesome, the, awesome. The, Great, so, yep, Ethan put the link in the chat um, where to buy conservation ranching products. And um, there is not a dot in the state of Missouri right now. Although there are, I wanna say maybe 12 ranches that are actually Audubon certified at the moment in Missouri, which is really cool. Does anybody else have a question? Um, Deb says in the chat, um, they're trying to basically trying to um, eat more plant based meats, animal products that are produced on smaller family farms, ranches close to this. But how much good does that really do? So, Deb, I guess I feel about it like I know that individually it can be really overwhelming and, and we're all like, I'm just one small person, like how much difference am I really going to make? But think about the fact that i mean we for better or worse we live in a capitalist society and consumer dr demand drives a lot of the system so if we as consumers if a lot of us are like this is what i want i want you know small farm locally produced meats vegetables whatever um there, the more demand there will be, the more chances these folks have to stay in business. And ultimately, I would argue the more chances we have to really make the case that the, um, you know, the, the government agency programs, such as things like the Farm Bill, the USDA programs that often go to larger producers, the whole economic discussion, a lot of the loans um guaranteed go to larger producers it's really hard for a lot of small operators to get loans for things like equipment and and certainly for them to get the cost share programs that help them you know do things like improve habitat or you know improve their grazing rotation system or whatever so the more demand there is the more that they and we as advocates can make a case for saying let's keep supporting this and building up this type of system so really quick example is that um meat meat processing is a really really big bottleneck in the industrial system and it's controlled mostly by corporations um during the pandemic i think folks all heard about that becoming a serious problem. It's been it's been very hard for small processors, like literally small butcher operations for a variety of reasons, and mid-size to compete with these huge production facilities. Well, one of the things that came down in the American Rescue Plan and for which some of our Missouri legislators actually um, negotiated really well for the state of Missouri was was funding to upgrade some of our small and mid-size processors. Um, and so that was essentially just like a, a um, situation with a lot of things coming together. And one of them was consumer demand for, for these processing facilities for our smaller farms to be able to get in at a processor so they could, they could have their meat processed. That's exactly a point that I was going to make, and also that a lot of our larger meat processors in Missouri are controlled by foreign-owned uh, meat corporations. And so when you're talking about those, you're talking about Smithfield um, and uh, what's the beef? Uh, J JBS. JBS. JBS, yeah. yeah. And um, so I think a way to impact things is to call your grocer and ask them not to carry products from certain processors or in, in if you wanna keep it on a positive note, ask them to carry Patchwork Farms pork. You know, I mean, that, that when I go around Columbia, I should see Patchwork Farms at every grocery store, you know, because it's, easy for them to get it you know and it's it's local and uh it's better you know i want to buy it do i want to have to go over to patchwork farms and buy it It would be so much more convenient for me 
if I could buy it while I was buying some other things. And you can do that at grocery stores like Clover's, you know, uh, and things like that. But, uh, you know, asking a grocery store to carry a, a product from someone that you know grows a good product is is changing things. And tell them you're well, willing to pay more for it. You're obviously willing to pay more for it if you're buying it at the farmer's market, you know, which goes directly to the farmer. And it's a great way to shop with them. Uh, but not everybody can get to the farmer's market. I mean, producers wise. And actually, um, patchwork. Laura is an example of, I do not find their prices very high at all. I don't know what would happen. I, I don't, I usually go do it directly, like from um, the Missouri Rural Crisis Center patchwork office. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, I wasn't super- meaning patchwork was really expensive, but some of the, some, like oh, some definitely buying are. a whole chicken that's organic is, is, tends to be a lot more than what you would buy absolutely in the store. but it tastes way better and uh it, and you know, it's, it's comparable to uh you know the 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 big organic if you will right like the industrial so yeah okay the thing is organic but it, it's you know a division of of tyson or whatever that just happens to be like their fed organic feed and it's really expensive and it's not um what it's not what it's not what you get at is. the farmer's market. <laughs> no, you know? no. Yeah, mm-hmm. the taste is way different. Any other questions? There's some good stuff in the chat, Paul. Just so everyone knows. Yeah, I think that calling the grocery stores is is on my list. It's at the top of my list because... Uh, they want to know what consumers who come there want to buy, you know, and what draws people to their market. And so if you get, give them the help that they want to figure that out, you know, that they will try to please you. Yeah, Ethan wrote in the chat, also ask it of restaurants as well. Yeah, and we do have a lot of good restaurant choices in Colombia that mm-hmm. buy local uh, yep. farm products. We don't have very many here in Marshall, just saying. Uh, Marley notes that um, a lot of farmers markets have double up food box programs that folks can use with their food stamps to buy produce, meat, etc. I didn't know that. So yeah, another point of education to help with using the farm bill nutrition portion wisely because that's where that comes from so well um this has been really a great uh opportunity for learning i think and and i hope you all will share it with the folks that you know and uh, we'll try to do more of these as the year goes on on different topics that um we can all get behind because, you know, it's one thing to care about the environment and it's another to become active for the environment. And being an activist is becoming more and more important for the average American because we have a lot of money paying for legislation that is not put out there by uh, actual uh, Americans who want to live healthy lives. <laughs> Good summary. All right. Well, um, if there's not anything else, I think we can uh, see you all next time. Thanks so much, Laura.